Welcome to the Retail Corner podcast. Uh, our guest here today is Julie Vargas. She is the VP of North American uh, Avery Dennison. She's been with that company for a little over a decade and held many, many different uh, uh, positions. But she is really known for being a RFID expert uh, right there on the bleeding edge of technology. And so, Julie, hi. I'm happy hi. to see you. Hi. Great to be with you. And so, uh, with me, we, we've talked a little bit in the past and everything else, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Could you kind of give us some insights as to your background and responsibilities of what exactly does a vice president do? Because a lot of people don't know. It's fair, fair enough. Um, no, so my background, I've been in RFID technology since about 2009. But obviously, over time, that, that looks very different, how that interacts with different technologies primarily around automation and inventory uh, accuracy. But my, my role right now, I have the privilege of leading the North American division for identification solutions. So we're working on a multiple um, different solution sets for automation uh, and data digitization across food and logistics segments here in North America. Okay, wow. So that you, you kind of have your, have your fingers in a lot of different places, a lot, a lot of different pies. As a market expert, have you seen sustainability initiatives shape the journey of the business in the past few years? Like, is there anything that's really come onto the stage the last couple of years that's that's really been uh, important to sustainability? Absolutely. I think there's a lot more data-based um, elements and the intentions are there. So it's no longer... Um, something that only the you know the the most sustainable companies talk about. Everyone really has intention to become more sustainable, and you've seen things like science-based target initiatives. Everyone is working not just to say um, they're going to be sustainable, but also measure their impact. Um, the the whole COVID supply chain crunch crisis also yeah. led folks to realize that there's a lot of acceptable loss and a lot of um, nuances across supply chain and production that are opportunities for us to be more sustainable as a whole. Um, the next generation for this, I think we're starting to see it now, is not just to talk about sustainability as a separate pillar or initiative, but weaving it into the decisions that businesses are making. It's becoming table stakes for all of us, specifically in the manufacturing side of the house. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of, uh, lot of money being left on the table from that, when it comes to that kind of thing. That's right. That's right. And so uh, I just went to NRF. A, little, a couple weeks ago, and uh, your team was there. A lot of people talking about frictionless uh, inventory, frictionless uh, interactions with a, uh, uh, whether it be at the register or at at the inventory scanner. Um, how uh, uh, how are you seeing that being applied within the within the retail sphere to actually put that sustainability into practice? Into practice, yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting time. I mean, the last decade's been interesting, right? So if you go back even just 10 years ago, um, retail was much more of a push function. So uh, brands and retailers decided what assortment they would have. You would come to the store and you would get to pick from anything you wanted as long as it was there. Um, with the rise of of e-commerce in general, but of course, um, large uh, large e-commerce giants like, like Amazon and others, now the consumer is actually pulling a lot more when it comes to how they want to shop and how they want to buy products. So one of them is, is frictionless, but it almost, it actually goes back to separating retail into two big camps. One of them is frictionless because it's so easy for me to push a button and just get what I need and have it delivered where I want to. So everyone in the retail space has to be ready to have the right product, get in, get out, or sit in my car, have it delivered to me, drop it on my doorstep. I'm in charge now of getting whatever I need as fast as I want it from multiple different locations. For a retailer to become competitive, they have to play in that frictionless space as well. Um, some of that's actually uh, coming into you know entire retail models. What is an, uh, you know a store look like when you can go in, get what you want, check out and not talk to a single single person. Um, the other side of that retail is also an opportunity. So when you're doing a big purchase or you're looking to discover new things, there is an opportunity for retailers to think through their assortment, think through how their experience um, is showing up in a way that can differentiate them for those special shopping occasions as well. All right. And so like when you're talking about uh, like delivery and, and in-car pickup and and uh, whether it be any sort of uh, one of the delivery services or Walmart itself or Amazon or something like that, uh, the time from shelf to customer is being reduced. 
a lot. And so handling um, handling recalls and handling food waste and spoilage is is becoming more and more of a, a talking point with people. And so when it comes to RFID tracking, is is that something you guys are, are looking at with when it comes to expiration dates and food waste? Yeah, I mean, think about fresh in general. So omnichannel grocery is still very low in penetration, but we all got really comfortable with it um, in a forced <laughs> way. Like that new QR codes, I think, were two things that were kind of dead in the water. And all of a sudden now we all know how to do both. Absolutely. Um, but fresh is still a big one. So you'll hear a lot of people say, hey, I'll do automated subscriptions for toilet paper or for household goods, but I wanna pick my avocados, right? And so there's a level of information around the freshness of product that is a real opportunity to you know, exponentially grow some of these, uh, you know, um, what we would call omni-channel models for grocery. And so when you think about that, uh, you need to have item information uh, that can be pertinent for, for your customers as well. The other piece of this is going back to that push model, there wasn't always a connection between consumption and production. So what was happening is we'd overproduce, we'd overstock the shelves, and there's a lot of places in the middle where you can lose freshness or products can go bad, especially perishable goods. And that's a real opportunity, not just to you know reduce the carbon footprint associated to food waste, but it's a financial one too. So um, we talk about this being, you know, a, a penny margin business, and that's true when you're looking at the top line and pricing and things like that. But there's a lot of acceptable loss across the supply chains um, when it comes to the amount of time that's lost, or even the amount of food that's produced for what we're actually consuming. Those can all be opportunities, but only if you can see and measure the problem in a way that you can action it quickly. Um, I actually think there's even a competitive advantage for a grocer. So when I go online and, and shop my, my cart for my pickup in the car, I can pick, I want, you know, I want the steak that has three days of freshness left because I cannot be, I cannot be um, uh, held uh, accountable to cooking it in one day. Sometimes I change exactly. things. Yeah. <laughs> so that's an opportunity for, for a new data set to really give you a competitive advantage when you're not seeing and touching the products in a way that um, no one's really taken full advantage of, but there is a lot of work in progress to really drive that. And it will have opportunities in both top line growth and in reducing waste along the supply chain. So you're really caring about what's going out the front door as well as the back door kind of okay. thing and, and making sure that that waste is, is accounted for because a lot of it's just thrown now. And, and there's, there's, I've seen handwritten sheets of, of what's a, uh, what's going out the back door. And so um, that kind of makes sense. And so you talk about the whole chain of like supply chain, which link in that chain do you think stuff should be tagged at? Yeah, the, the best place to do it. I mean, we've been um, so th for those who aren't uh, kind of familiar with how package, package products work today, you're, you're basically printing or putting information on most of your products um, right after they're harvested or produced. So that's the right step to also take that information that's lived analog printed on packaging for, for decades yeah. and turn that into a digitally connected moment. So we, we're doing it right. We're adding the information to websites and e-commerce. Why not then take it one step further and put the specific product information on each specific product? So instead of just stamping the expiration date, connect all the all the information so you can read it wirelessly and know, OK, I actually do have the right product going to the right truck, delivering to this store with this many days of freshness. And then beyond that, say, OK, I can expose that information to show my consumers how much freshness they have. And in the case of a safety event, like a food recall, instead of just throwing away the entire shelf of spinach, let's use that very specific information to surgically remove the ones that are impacted, because that will have an impact both in what you can sell through, but also in the planet. Those are all ending up in a landfill as well. Right, because I mean, we've seen serialized RFID within the higher end or within within like things that are already have a serial number, like firearms or something like that. But you you're wanting to, to push it down even further down to that level where it's it's serialized to, to the stake kind of thing. You got That's, it. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, when I first started in this industry, it was, it was really interesting. Um, it, it was very new technology. And one of the, the biggest pieces is not just does the technology work. We all know that piece. It has to also be something that can be high fidelity, 
um, the right price point, but also deliver the right business case. For apparel and footwear, they're doing, they're using this technology today. So instead oh, yeah. of manually with that clipboard saying, oh, I see three large shirts, they can wirelessly read the store in a matter of minutes and understand, okay, here's the, the true shore up of inventory to what it says that I've sold, um, and then make decisions on what they expose to the mobile app. You'll hear even in your shopping, you know, on your mobile app, you're, you're going to see a larger assortment than in the past because we're not accounting for inaccuracy in numbers. For food, it gets really exciting because it's a penny margin business. Anyone, you don't have to be in the food industry and you will know the first line they say is we're a penny margin business, right? Um, but there's three to four pennies out there that's being thrown away um, from just products that go bad or products that aren't sellable. And here's a great opportunity to really start to get more granular with the data set in a way that allows retailers to retail faster, hit all of these omnichannel models, and fundamentally reduce some of the acceptable loss that we just assume is going to end up either in the garbage or um, in, in a, a secondary market, sure. potentially eventually expiring and not being useful. Okay. And so, so with all that, with, with kind of being where we are, looking forward, Seeing, seeing the future into your crystal ball, what, what do you, what is the strangest thing we're using RFID on right now, and where, where do you want it to go? Where do you think we're headed next? The strangest thing. That's a, that's a good. Um, there's a good question there. I think there's some there there. I don't, I'm not sure if I have a good one there. Um, although I will say that it is being used in all different sectors going back to actual data that can be read wirelessly. So um, okay. I think there's a couple of places where you might find it unexpected um, and everything from, you know, protein bars at your favorite uh, athletic shop because their whole store, all the apparel footwear is tagged. So they're tagging everything down to the last, the last uh, protein bar. Um, you might go, wow, do we really need that information? Sure you do. You don't want to buy an expired protein bar or not end up with one when you have a chance to sell it. Um, I think that the, where it's going though, I get really excited and I'm a total geek about this. In fact, my family, I, I the, the Thanksgiving list has dwindled over the years maybe because I'm too much of a geek about some of this technology. Um, but there are things in my life anyways that I don't necessarily like to have to manage. Um, we just talked about my inability to cook the steak that I buy the same day. Um, my dream state for the future is that this information is exposed to the consumers that want it exposed. We now are connected everywhere. We have a hub in our hands. We have multiple devices connected <laughs> yeah, on our arms. They're everywhere. Um, and so my dream state is that all this information then aggregates in a way that as a consumer, I can not have to spend time thinking about the stuff that is an efficiency gain for me in my life. I'll give you two examples. Yeah. One is in the closet. So I have a seven-year-old daughter. She outgrows things every six months. I would love for a device to tell me, hey, these things are no longer her size. Um, do you want me to put them on for you know sale at eBay? Or do you want to have a pickup from Goodwill later this week? Those types of things oh, would wow. be great. Um, but my my true dream state, because I'm not a cook by any means, maybe that's why people aren't coming to Thanksgiving now that I think about it. <laughs> but, maybe. Okay, okay. It's okay. But I would love for my refrigerator to say, hey, look, you know, milk is out. We're going to automatically put it in your cart um, or even better. I know that in your fridge, you have a steak with two days of fresh. You've got this much spinach and these other ingredients. Here's what you can cook for dinner um, and automate some of those things. Uh, and again, it's not for everyone. Not everyone would want this amount of information shared. But for those who do, um, and again, it has nothing to do with me. It won't know who I am. It just knows what the products are and what their expiry is. Um, and, and how can it actually automate some of the things that are more mundane tasks, like figuring out your shopping list or what's for dinner? That'd be amazing. Have uh, come home and have your refrigerator tell you what's for dinner. That's a, uh, that's perfect. And so, uh, that's, that's kind of cool. And so let me shift a little bit, just as a little bit more to your journey, a little bit more to your philosophy of, of business here. And so we realize that mentor, mentorship is huge. And I, I know you've been a mentor to, to several people and, and I'm sure you've had mentors. And so how has that changed your, your career path. How has that changed your life? That the, the idea of mentorship. Yeah, it's it's really important to me, and I would say some are beyond mentors. They're actual sponsors in my journey. Um, it, there have been people that have given me incredible insights, um, but even even more importantly, space to develop and grow, um, find boundaries 
fail, become resilient. Uh, a lot of the, the path along the way, you can have the best technology, the best product, the best service. In the end, we're people um, serving other people. And so the mentors and the sponsors that I have had and learned from have given me this incredible path for growth um, and a growth mindset. In other words, right. not having the right answers, but understanding how to process, look at things, and then ultimately be resilient and, and adjust along the way. Um, and that's been people that I've mentored as well. I've actually learned as much from uh, folks that where I've been their mentor, uh, because I think in the end, none of us have the right answers. No one wakes up with all the right answers. We're all just trying to get to the best one. And so advice from my seven-year-old all the way through senior executives sitting on boards have had different roles in my ability to approach the problem, which is almost more important than what you're actually delivering as a solution. Um, and I think that's been incredible. Um, and so I highly recommend ever, everyone should always be learning um, and you can learn from a lot of places. And definitely uh, for those who have mentored and sponsored me, I, I wanna pay it back, pay it forward every day. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. So uh, we, we only got a couple more minutes left here. And so I want to ask you one question. We try to ask this to everybody else in the universe that if you had to give yourself advice back in the day, or if you had advice for somebody who's wanting to do what you do, what yeah. would it be? Oh, gosh, there's so many. Um, I, I think the biggest is resilience. Like just do not get in your own way or your own head. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, nobody, nobody has the right answers. It's all about how you're, you're growing and learning. And that can be cumulative. It's not, it's, there's not some big moment where you're like, I did it. I made it. We are here. Um, you actually uh, don't tend to appreciate or understand the value of the small things that accumulate over time um, that drive your success. And that goes both ways. You also may not realize the impact you're having on others in small ways along that that journey as well. Um, probably the biggest one, though, is is just straight up resilience. I was always afraid of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, um, or, or making the wrong decision, the wrong call. The reality is um, finding those boundaries uh, when you're building a growth business or you're an entrepreneur, or you're trying to drive something really big. It's it, it's not been done before. So so you almost have to have as many wrong, you know, wrong attempts, uh, you know, failed experiments as you do successful moments, appreciate them just as much. Um, in the end, be really passionate about what you do because it's really hard to build something from scratch or build something big. Um, and so having that passion and that resilience and kind of the ability to get back up, that is the one thing that I wish I had learned earlier in my career um, and passed it forward uh, because it, it, it's empowering. And um, you you really don't have limits. If you're not held back by boundaries, you can find brand new spaces to pioneer. That's cool. That's perfect. And so I think that's a, per a wonderful thing to end on. Uh, Julie, thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. Uh, you guys are experts over there at Avery on the, in the RFID world, and I appreciate you. So uh, if you have any questions or anything else, uh, Julie's information will be below. And it, I, I can't say anything, but thank you. Thank, thank, it's always a pleasure talking with you, Cole. Thanks for letting uh, me and, and on behalf of Avery Dennison as well, come and join you today. I'm excited about where the future is taking us and thanks for helping us pioneer new, new conversations to get there. Perfect. We'll talk later. If you would like to be featured on our podcast, please email us at podcast at retailcorner.live or visit our website, retailcorner.live. Looking forward to having you as our guest on our podcast. And thank you so much for listening.